Welcome to Pine Thicket Philosophies, the non-podcast podcast where we do everything the podcast experts tell you not to do. If you are looking for a finely polished and professional podcast crew, well folks, we ain't in. But if you want to virtually join a group of old outdoorsmen from Southern Appalachia as we sit around the fire and talk about any one of our favorite topics, well pour a cup of coffee, pull up a chair, and enjoy. say without a doubt this is the first time in human history that this kind of setup has been put out into a, the swamp. Hello, 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 this hello. swamp is this is his first. You're you're probably correct. First I, might, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean a podcast hello, from hello, hello, hello. deep in the a seven hundred square mile swamp that's not normal. Yeah. Well, hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you now hear? They, there's probably been some YouTube videos shot here by people other than us. Oh yeah, a lot of those. <laughs> so we're back, and I have uh, kind of put Jr. on the spot because I just kind of said, "Hey, I want to just do a story time with Poe," because anybody that knows Jr. Poe knows that he is the the storyteller extraordinaire. And um, so we kind of put him on the spot. So he's he uh, we don't even know what story he is going to tell. So we're just going into this just as blind as the rest of y'all. So I will now turn the floor to John Russell Poe. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, he, he said he wanted to do this thing. And so I thought, well, since we're out in the wilderness, I'd talk about, you know, animal encounters. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was holding my recliner down i didn't want it to go nowhere and i heard a noise out on the front porch and i went over to to look out and right outside the door was a metal trash can that we kept dog food in and there was a raccoon up on top of it and was trying to lift the lid while it was standing on the lid which made me think maybe it was not a very intelligent creature um but i hollered for my my wife and kids to come and look and they came in there and it got down on the the floor there on the, on the porch and and it was raising its little paws up in the air and looked like a little circus animal and it was so cute and all um and so my wife said we need to run it off because we don't want it eating the cat's food and so on you know so all right so she takes a broom and she goes outside and we're watching her and she walks across the porch and it turns around and runs at her and runs her happy butt back in the house uh, and then it just kind of turned around and give her a look over its shoulder and it just kind of sauntered off into in the wilderness there. And, and we really didn't think no more about it. Well, the next day I was piddling with some stuff and, and the wife come to me and she said, uh, said, all the cat food's gone down there in the basement. Um, do you, do you think that coon come down in there during the night, you know, and, and eat the, you know, the cat's food? And I said, no, I think it's, it's long gone. Don't worry about it. And, and so things went on uh you know and i was piddling with something else and she said i put some more food in them bowls down there and and it's gone already and i said well if you looked at them cats you know i mean they're so fat their little legs just kind of stick out to the side and just kind of roll around and i said you know goodness uh any one of them would eat that much food so you know i didn't think no more about it so a couple of hours later uh she says hey i know it's got to be something uh put more cat food out and it's gone and I said okay so i'll go down there and look so i'm down in the basement and i'm shining the light around here there and everywhere every little nook and cranny and sure enough up on a shelf not too far from where she fed the cats i seen this little tuft of fur and i thought well it is here you know uh, and it, it likes it here because it's got a woman coming down here for a couple of hours and putting food out for it, you know, making sure it has plenty of drinking water. And it's got a nice, comfortable place to sleep. So, you know, it was it was right at home. So I said, well, open up the door real good, you know, and stand back, and I'm going to take a, a, a broom handle, and I'm going to, you know, shove it up off of this shelf and run it out. That is not exactly what happened apparently he was not happy with me waking him up and when he hit the ground 
from about six foot up. Uh, he stood up on his back legs and snarled and looked at me like it was fixing to tear me apart. And, of course, me and it had a little confab there with the broom, and it run and got up and under a pallet that some stuff was in on there and it was stuffed up under this pallet and i couldn't get to it and it was under there just doing the little growling guttural growling sound and i thought i gotta get this thing out of here you know and so i thought about it and thought about it ah got an idea so i got my boy's red rider bb gun and i got over there to the side so i could see it you know and i pumped that thing and i shot it right in its buttocks and it was really not happy then. It wasn't coming out from under the pallet, but it was growling, blah, 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 and making all kinds of horrible racket. And so I cocked it and <laughs> shot it one more time, and this time it come at me. I mean, it was coming at me some kind of bad. And I was hitting it with that Red Rider BB gun, trying to keep it off of me. And, I mean, it, it, it would go across the floor and come right back, and I hit it two or three more times. And then it went over into the corner and just splattered out, you know, like you can't see me here. I'm not moving. I'm invisible. And I thought, I'm not messing with you. And so we got out of the basement. I went down to the garage. I got my live trap because I'm a real humane kind of guy. So I got my live trap because I really didn't want to shoot it with a shotgun in my own basement. Uh, so I got my live trap, and I put it down there. And I got a little paper plate, and I put some cat food on it, and I put it in the back of the trap. And then I had a little camera that hooked to a, a monitor upstairs, kind of like a baby monitor kind of camera. I set it up pointed it at it and we went upstairs and sat there like idiots watching that monitor for the longest time so we and then after about an hour we started getting up and walking around doing other stuff we come back by and look and i come by the camera one time or by the, the monitor and i looked and there it was it reached through the, the the side of the cage grabbed that paper plate pulled it over to the side and was sitting there on its haunches reaching over and eating cat food like it was at the <laughs> movies eating popcorn just, i mean it was like it was heaven and it just sat there and done it until all the cat food on the plate was gone and then it crawled back to its other hiding place thought okay this ain't gonna work so i go back down to the basement i get the trap i put the cat food in there without <laughs> the paper plate so he can't move it over there and then we we waked well didn't nothing happen till about nine o'clock at night and i'm like i'm going to bed so the next morning i get up and i first thing i do is i go in and I look at that monitor and the trap is gone and i'm like how can that big have a heart trap be completely you know gone so i go down to the basement very carefully I open the door and I look in and sure enough, the trap is not where I put it, but it was across the room. Uh, apparently, this thing had got a hold of an extension cord and had pulled the trap across the floor uh, trying to figure a way to escape. I don't know what he's going to do, uh, do a MacGyver, get that, you know, uh, to cut the wires, I don't know. Anyway, and over next to where he pulled it was a bunch of Walmart bags, yada, yada, yada. And it had pulled all kinds of anything it could get its little hands on inside that trap. But it was trapped. And I'm like, all right, you're out of here. So I went to grab a hold and pick up the trap. And every time I did, it would reach through the, the little cage there trying to get a hold of me. And I'm like, this ain't going to work. So we finally got my wife on one end, me on the other with bungee cords. And we lifted it up and we took it out and put it in the back of the truck. And the whole time it was snarling and growling and having a fit. It wasn't slobbering at the mouth, so I didn't really think it was rabies, but it very well could have been. I didn't, you know, exactly exchange fluids with it. So uh, we went ahead and, you know, we got it out there in the back of the truck. And I thought, well, I'm going to go now. get rid of it. It just, it just shut off those batteries died. So oh, I need to put man. new batteries in. All right, so the last thing we got. Are we there? Yes, we're. we're are you going to edit it together, or you yes. want me to continue, continue where I am? And well, leave the the blemishes in. We, I don't know. We'll see what it sounds like. <laughs> but um, we, where it cut off was y'all had I, I bungee know. cord. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we managed to get the thing in the back of the truck, and you know, and I was thinking, I got to do something with this thing because uh, I got to go to school. I was doing the school teaching thing, you know. Um, for a long time and enjoyed it too but i thought i got it you know so i thought well i'll just 
get rid of it on the way to school. I'll just stop somewhere, open the cage, you know, let it do its thing. And so I was running a little bit behind, you know, uh, for me anyway, which is about 30 minutes early. So I just went ahead and, and dropped the boys off, uh, my, my two sons dropped them off at school, and I seen the custodian coming across the parking lot, and I thought, hey, I think I'll have him come over here and look at this, uh, this raccoon. And so he, you know, I holler, hey, Dan, he comes over there, and as he looks his head over into the bed of the truck right there where the trap was, it went to snarling and reaching out trying to get a hold of him, and like to scared him to death because he was not expecting that. I said, Dan, come look in the truck here, and, and, you know, and that's what he got. Well, after it done it the first time, then he thought it was comical, and he would just get over there close to it, and it just all of a sudden go, ah! you know, and get scared of the thing. And then it would go go to reaching at him again because, I mean, it was vicious, and it wanted to get a hold of somebody. And I said, Dan, if you don't care, would you take my truck up the road there a little ways and let this thing out? You know, he said, sure, be glad to. So I gave him my keys, and, and he, he went on up the road there. He said he was driving on up there to a place that they was going to make a little uh some kind of little cul-de-sac down there and gonna sell some lots and something but anyhow it was barren at the time so he just went down there and was going to let it out so uh see he goes back there and that's down the tailgate and thing is still reaching through trying to get a hold of him and he's like well how am i going to get a hold of that little trap door if it keeps trying to grab me every time i do that and then he, he thought oh yeah so i had a toolbox uh, in the back of my truck <laughs> that went all the way across and he opened it up and then there was a pair of long pliers so he yeah this is it so he opened up the door to the truck and he gets back there and reaches over the the, the sideboards and uh grabs hold of that latch and as he lets it go with them pliers he runs and gets in the truck and he's looking over the back glass you know to see if the thing had got out you know he's looking through the back glass of the truck and all of a sudden this thing hits the window just and splatter and it's i mean still just vicious i mean it was hanging onto that back glass like in little garfield dolls and wanting to get in there to him and then it went up and got on top of the truck and then got over on the hood of the truck and was getting a hold to the the windshield wipers and was pulling at them you know and it's like you know you're gonna have to come out here with me you know so dan said i don't know what i'm gonna do so he just put it into gear and started you know away and of course you know the truck hood being slick you know it, <laughs> it, it kind of fell off onto the ground but it didn't run off it stood up on its back legs and threatened him again like you just just get out here me and you right here you know but Dan, he said, he said that was the craziest thing, and he went off and you know and, and left it. He come back, brought my truck, you know, was telling me about that. And I said, you left it there? Uh, he said, yeah, it looked like a good place. I said, well, there's some old women that uh, come down there and walk every day around that that cul-de-sac. They may be jogging or you know, or power walking at least. You know when they go down there, if that coon gets after. Them. But as far as I know, there was any talk about you know a rabid coon down there attacking anybody. But it was it was a coon adventure, that's for sure. Anyway. I got I got to know. Okay. Who was who was the little old women that used to walk down there? Because I. I don't know their names. I just know that, that since they made that, that you know, they was going to have a subdivision done in there. Mm-hmm. And it was a, no no traffic. Yeah. And they walked in there every day. I don't remember. I just remember there was, you know. I, I would have. You I, probably do. I, I could. I was I was hoping you would name a couple, but so I would have had to edit it out. You visualize in your mind yes. and them being terrorists. Yes. Being chased by a raccoon, <laughs> yeah. I, I well, think. Where, where's the cul-de-sac at? Well, you're going from the school towards 71. Oh, just yeah. a little ways out there to the right, it went back. I, uh, back Eve, in there, where Eve lives. Had a oh, house in okay. There. But at that time, there was no houses in there. Yeah, the, where they built that first one there on the right as you turn off, mm-hmm. and then it went on down in. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I but, didn't know they had an actual cul-de-sac down at the end of it. Mm-hmm. There was probably about six houses, maybe eight in there. Maybe. <clears throat> maybe. I've got several students that live down in there. Yeah. But. Yeah, and now they're probably all terrorized by your rabid raccoon. Yeah, raccoon. one story at a time is enough because it takes a lot out of you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're going to tell a story, you know, you really it's need a to. full body experience. You, you need to experience it. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So um, that was uh, story time with Poe. So we appreciate you tuning in. We'll we'll try to uh, 
you know, go through and edit up and fix our <laughs> fix our our battery dying here, and then the phone call right as we're getting restarted. So we'll try to get all that out. But all right, anyway, thanks for tuning in, guys. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for tuning in for this episode of Pine Thicket Philosophies. Tune in next time as we continue to live by our motto, even bad adventures make great stories.